But if you have a Bible, would you open it up with me to Galatians chapter 5 this morning? Galatians chapter 5. We're in our fourth week, I believe, third week of this series that we've uh, titled Empowered. And uh, if you're new or you're visiting this morning or even if you're joining us online, uh, the, the hope for this year would be to see our church grow into the, the life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so each week we've been looking at a different aspect of how the New Testament talks about this, about what it means for the people of God, as Jesus told his disciples, to be sent out into the world in, in, with the power of the Holy Spirit leading them in all that they would do. And so we've seen each week that one of the key features of, a, of an empowered life is a life of service. And we've highlighted that every week because uh, we see in the scriptures that whenever the Holy Spirit falls upon men and women and they're empowered by God, they begin using the capacities and the gifts and the talents that the Lord has given them for the sake of God's kingdom and for the glory of, of King Jesus. And so uh, today I want to just go to a passage of scripture that I think really outlines kind of in some respects the totality of this idea. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, a church that apparently has fallen for false teaching and false doctrine. They've gone away from believing the gospel and have slipped back into some uh, legalism and some ways of, of trying to earn or curry favor from God. And so Paul is at the end of this letter encouraging the church to, to grow into the fullness of what God has called them into, namely the freedom that God has given them by empowering them with the Holy Spirit. And he does so by setting up a really helpful contrast for us that we're going to dive into this morning, the contrast of, of life in the spirit versus life in the flesh, or as I'm going to say this morning, a, a life of empowerment or a life of enslavement. And that's what Paul is pointing out here for the people in the church of Galatia. Look with me, if you will, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. My freshman year of college, uh, I had been a Christian for about six months, and I went to a conservative, super conservative Baptist school because I sensed the Lord was leading me into ministry, and if you were going into ministry, that's the one that everyone said you were supposed to go to. And, and I landed there, and I began to observe something that I think uh, to this day remains a pretty clear like category distinction. When I, when I got to school there, uh, I've shared some of this with you guys before, I, I'd come from a pretty dysfunctional home, and I'd kind of been on my own for a couple years. And so I, I land at this school, and I'm like, wow, this is a pretty neat situation. I get to play intramural sports. The cafeteria always has Lucky Charms, and the little dispensers always stocked. I get three meals. I, you know, I, like it's a, it's a pretty cool setup. And there were people at the local churches who would uh, let college students come and like do their laundry. And I was like, this is better than my own home. You know, like, this, is, this is a big deal. And so I... I I, I, I loved it for the first couple of weeks. Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And yeah, it was, I didn't realize it at the time, but there was quite a bit of rules involved. But I kind of overlooked those things because of all the benefits that I had gotten from, from being there. But then I started meeting some kids who come from a background very similar to the background of the school, which was not my background. So they had maybe gone to a really uber conservative, like elementary, middle school, high school, and had parents who had sent them to that school thinking that, 
they'll just keep on keeping on. Like this school will keep them on the straight and narrow. And about two weeks into this place, I started bumping up against these other students, and they were going crazy. Like they were like, woo <laughs> rules, forget the rules. My parents aren't here. I'm going to do whatever I want. And I was like, whoa, like I didn't know that happened at places like this. You know, it kind of shocked me for a second. And I started learning about this, what I now believe to be a, a, a truism about what people do with freedom. Like my perspective at the time was I have the freedom to do all of these other things. If I stay within the confines of the rules, I have the freedom to eat as much Lucky Charms as I want. I have the freedom to play ping pong with friends. I have the freedom to play all the intramural sports. Like just being a part of this institution gives me all of these liberties and blessings. And then these other folks had the freedom from, freedom from the scrutiny of their parents, freedom from the analysis of, of their surrounding community, freedom from the, the rules and regulations they felt like they were, they were reared in, that they had come to disdain or hate. And I think that, that, kind of, that those two categories is sort of what is at play here when Paul is talking to the church in Galatia. What are you going to do with your freedom? You know, it's Martin Luther King weekend, the famous speech of Dr. King ends with free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, free at last. That's the aspiration of the human spirit, the desire of our souls, the longing that we have to, 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 to live into the freedom that we've been granted from above. But what do you do with it? And Paul here is saying there's a potential that exists, even for believers in Jesus, who've come to recognize the freedom that they have because of the blood of Christ shed on their behalf, that they would then take that freedom and perhaps abuse it. That, that there's a chance that they would use the freedom for selfishness. There's a chance that they would lean into a life, once again, of enslavement. And so as Paul sets up this contrast, I don't want you to think of it this morning as an either or. Either you're living the empowered life or you're living the enslaved life. I want you to think of it as a, as a continuum, as, as a spectrum. That At any given moment, we're either moving towards more empowerment and more freedom in the spirit or moving towards more enslavement, more captivity to our own flesh. That's why Paul says these two are opposed to one another. You're moving in one direction or the other. So for you this morning, which one is it? I want to show you this morning the contrast that I think he paints for us. The, the life of enslavement or life in the flesh versus the life of empowerment or the life in the spirit. And then finally this morning, just ask the question, what does it look like if we were today to choose the life of being empowered by the spirit of God? Life of enslavement, life of empowerment. How do we live the life of empowerment. First off, the life of enslavement. As we talked about this difference between freedom from or freedom to, Paul is telling the church, you have a freedom to live in these ways because God has liberated you, because he's um, given you the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, because he's forgiven all your sins. Your, your life now, the possibilities are endless. So we've been talking about in this series, the empowered life is one where we're not looking at, at the limitations that we have because of our regrets or because of our sins, but instead our eyes on the horizon fixated on, on, on the redemptive potential that we all have because the very power of God dwells within us now. And so Paul starts with, look, the, the life of, 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 of enslavement, life in the flesh, you don't want to go back to that. So we ask the question, well, what does it look like then to, to be enslaved? What does it look like to be held captive by the flesh? And Paul says very clearly, if you look back um, in verse 19, this is what it looks like to live life in the flesh. And I love the way that he phrases it. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are what? Are evident. So the first thing that we see about a life of enslavement is that it's evident. You can see it. it, it you don't have to guess. If we're living according to the flesh, we can just step back and analyze it and say, yeah, this is what it looks like. Life, the life of enslavement is, is, is evident. We live in morally confusing times. We live in a day and an age where people always want to question whether or not you can really discern what is the difference between good and evil. Paul has the audacity here to say that, well, it's actually quite easy. These things are apparent. You can lay eyes on them. You can see whenever someone is held captive to the flesh. It doesn't take a judge or a jury. Look again, verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you now as I warned you then, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
So Paul just rattles off a random list of stuff that he says, at face value, if you look at these things, we know that this is what it looks like to be completely enslaved to the flesh. And if you really press in on the list that he gives, they kind of go into two categories. The first one is a category where he basically says that, um, that th- th- these things arise because of, of our desires. I like the way that Eugene Peterson translates this in the message, by the way. It gets really, really clear there. He says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get our own way all the time. That's what he means by it is evident. It is obvious what kind of life develops when we try to get our own way all the time. That's a life of enslavement. That, that, that's a life according to the flesh. He says it's repetitive, it's loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or to be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. It's a pretty accurate, I think spot-on translation of what Paul intends there. Life according to the flesh, it is evident. Life of enslavement, it is obvious what kind of life develops when you insist on living life and always having your way. And then he he points and highlights, Paul does, I think, that, that one thing about life in the flesh is that it always begins with corrupted desires. Our desires are are malformed. Our our desires are truncated. They're not going towards the conclusion that God intended when he gave us desires and ambitions. Instead, they're turned in on themselves and namely in on ourselves. That's why he starts with all these sexual sins. He starts with sexual impurity. He talks about orgies. He talks about all sorts of stuff that Paul says, basically, look, the the life in the flesh is, is a life of enslavement. It's obvious because people's desires have taken them over. They can no longer direct their desires in a particular way. Instead, they're addicted to certain things. Their habits are left unchecked by the Spirit of God. And when that happens, we quickly devolve down to our lowest form of debased desires. When the Spirit's not pulling us to this life of freedom or or urging us, and we're not following in line with it to have this life of empowerment, instead, we'll wind up enslaved. Why? Because our enslavement to the flesh is always due to what's corrupted in our hearts. It's never excused by external factors. When we're enslaved, it's because, like Jesus said, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, nor can a good tree bear bad fruit. If you want different fruit, you've got to change the root. The tree's got to be rooted in something else in order for a different fruit to be produced. John Calvin once said that our hearts are idol-making factories. That's why Paul says in here in the middle, it's about idolatry. Our hearts crave and desire something, and our flesh comes along. This life of enslavement comes along and says, yeah, if you just pursue it hard enough, fast enough, or with enough intensity and will, you'll get it. And then we're enslaved to it. We worship, we turn small things into God things, and they become enslaving things, and we can't find freedom or liberation. That's what Paul says the life of enslavement looks like. Lastly, though, when Paul talks about the life of enslavement or what it looks like to be ruled by the flesh, he he shows that it always fractures relationships. One of the clear defining markers of a life that is lived according to the flesh is the breakdown of virtually all their relationships. Look at the back half of that list again in verse verse, uh, 19. So he starts off with sensuality, impurity, idolatry, sorcery, all these things. But then he goes to enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. Basically, he says, when people try to live according to the flesh, or as the message translates it, translates it, when we try to live as though we always get to have our own way, relationships begin to fragment. It gets really, really hard for people to get along with one another when everyone's always insisting on being the top dog or getting to call the shots. And so a life in the flesh or a life of enslavement will always fracture relationships. It's how that translation in the message ended, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. If you want to see the way that our current media is training us and discipling us, it's this vicious habit of always training us to depersonalize everyone into a rival. It's taking our flesh and you know, poking at it and saying, you can be free if you really just learn to hate the right people. <laughs> 
And so what Paul is showing us here, then, is that this life of enslavement or a life according to the flesh, it's evident. It's, it's because our desires are corrupted, and it will always end in the fracturing of relationships. So before we move on, well, let's try to apply it. How do I identify, then, in my own life areas that, that are enslaved to the flesh? How do I see on the spectrum of either walking towards empowerment or walking towards enslavement? I'm, I'm pursuing the wrong things. I think you can just take these three little... Um, descriptors that we've pulled out from this passage and kind of use that as a filter to evaluate our own hearts and lives. If it's evident, then I shouldn't have to think very long about the places of my life where I'm enslaved to the flesh. I think you know too. Like immediately, whenever you hear Paul say, life according to the flesh is evident, you go, oh yeah, that's the thing that I do. And if you're if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, as, as a professing believer in Jesus is, whenever you hear that, the conviction of the Spirit comes rushing in, and the Spirit points this out to us. We have desires that have been operating unimpeded by, by the check of the Holy Spirit. We've excused ourselves from the conviction of the Holy Spirit in some way. And in so doing, we're walking towards a, a life of enslavement. And almost without exception, I would say this morning, anywhere where there's some aspect of your heart or, or your life that's controlled by the flesh, it's causing a relationship to break down. It always does. So just like rewind the tapes. If you're married this morning, what was your last source of conflict? What's the thing that you keep arguing about? And if you drill down in that, if you go down into the foundation of what upholds that, that conflict, what makes that, that relationship erode, probably at its, at its very base form, a conflict of corrupted desires, of two sinners bumping up against one another, wanting to use the money, wanting to use their bodies, wanting to do whatever in this particular fashion, and you can't learn how to make those things come together. Because that's what life in the flesh does. And then verse 15, which is one of the really interesting verses in this entire letter. Paul says, if you live according to the Spirit, you'll walk in freedom. But if you don't, you'll do something else. And it's interesting what he says. You will bite and devour one another. In other words, when you're living according to the flesh, one of the evidences of that is the sins of the mouth. You start chewing other people up and spitting them out. You're, you're bent on this particular form of conflict. There's hostility that kind of always sort of swirls around your relationships, and you bite and devour other people. You consume them for your own good or for your own ends. Now, the alternative to that is not just a little bit less flesh. It's the life of the Spirit. It's the life of empowerment. And Paul says the life of empowerment is, is, is marked by freedom, but it's not freedom from rules and regulations. It's freedom to enjoy all the benefits that God has given you in the person of Jesus. It's a freedom to, to steward God's grace. It's a freedom to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's a freedom to feel the empowerment of God using you in ways that would build his kingdom and make his glory and his gospel known to the ends of the earth. That's what it looks like to, to be truly free. When Paul's talking to the church in Galatia, he says, look, in verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law, quoting Jesus, is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. If you really want to know what it feels like to be free, love your neighbor. In other words, quick summary of all of that. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has come and lived your life and died your death and rose again so that you can have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life so that your life is no longer controlled by your own ego or your corrupted ambitions. You now have a capacity, if you're a follower of Jesus, to not always have at the end of every endeavor your own glory. You can instead lay your life down because, after all, Jesus laid his life down and God accomplished eternal good through the laying down of his life. Why could he not do the same through mine? That's what life in, empowered by the Spirit is. Freedom in the Spirit is. You can now serve other people, catch this, for the first time perhaps with no strings attached. You don't have to get anything out of it. Because you know that you've been redeemed and reconciled and renewed by God by sheer grace. And so if God gave you grace with no strings attached, you can give service to another human with no strings attached. And Paul says, that's what true freedom is. We're liberated from transactional relationships forever. We can actually love other people despite, despite what they do because that's what God has done for us in Christ. It's true freedom, freedom to love and to serve others. 
And then here's the good news of the gospel, and this is why I want to talk about these things as being on a spectrum. You will, in fact, if you're empowered by the Spirit, Paul says, bear fruit in due time. You will bear fruit, and I put the caveat there, in due time. Because if you're like me, when you look at the fruit that is born by walking in the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you can be like, oh, man, I'm not there yet. And Paul says, after all, look, the the works of the flesh, they're evident. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, kindness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. And I read that list, and I'm like, okay, yeah, it's not as evident as the work of the flesh. I can find the work of the flesh. That's evident. Looked in the mirror this morning. Work of the flesh. There it is. The fruit of the Spirit, yeah, that's there. But give God time. Trust the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. These fruits will be born. That's the promise of Jesus in John 15. If you abide in me and and, and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Those who abide in me, they will in fact bear fruit. And our capacity to, to show forth these particular gifts, to show forth these particular fruits... It, it just it happens by, by a miracle, by, by the Spirit of God working within me. Am I more patient now than I used to be? I think so. I don't know how to measure that, but if it is there, it's because God's done it. It's not because there's a bone in my body that loves to learn how to be patient, because it doesn't exist. That's what the flesh is. Which, by the way, one of the more fascinating things about the way that Paul even writes this list is to prove this very point. So any, any first-year college English student would tell you, if you're going to write a compare and contrast paper, the two things have to be compared and contrast equally. You know, the old apples and oranges argument. So Paul should say the works of the flesh are, and then say the work of the spirit is, if he really wants to be accurate. Or he should say the fruit of the flesh is, and the fruit of the spirits are, but he doesn't. He says the work of the flesh is, and he rattles off a list, and then the fruit of the Spirit is, and he rattles off a different list. And he's comparing them and contrasting them, but he's using two different categories. Why? Because when the flesh works, this is what it looks like. Rivalries and dissensions and sexual immorality and impurity and idolatry. But when the Spirit bears fruit, in other words, God at work within us, empowering us by his Spirit, is always botanical and never mechanical. It's, it's, you need sun, you need, you need rain, you need time for fruit to be born. Fruit doesn't just show up whenever you want it to. Trust me, I've planted tons of plants in my life, killed them all. I can't make them produce what they're supposed to produce. And when it does happen, it feels like a miracle. Same thing with the Holy Spirit's work in my life. I can't force it. God will bear fruit in due time. And when we are empowered, we're, we're, we're growing in this particular way. And it just, just give it time. I heard a story once of a a pastor that had gone to visit the the graveside of one of his heroes of the faith. I think it was in in Scotland. And whenever he got there, he saw that the the man's headstone had been split in two and a giant tree had grown up in, in the middle of it. And he said he began to see after analyzing this, like, if you were to guess at the front end of this whole relationship, which one was going to win, a thousand pound slab of limestone or an acorn, you bet on the limestone, Right? It's never going never gonna to happen. But if the, if the acorn falls to the ground and dies, it'll win. You just got to give it time. And the point there is if the Holy Spirit indwells us, if the Holy Spirit empowers us, you got to give it time. It'll win. And you know, the flesh feels like a thousand pound slab of limestone, but it's not going to win because that's what Paul says. Spirit and the flesh are opposed to one another. The spirit lives within you. It's going to do something. It's going to produce something. And namely, it's going to produce restored and redeemed relationships in our lives. Think about this. All of the dynamics of the fruit of the spirit require another person to be evident. You can't grow spiritually in isolation, is what Paul's saying. It requires other people. You can't learn to be gentle just simply by being by yourself or kind or loving or patient. They all require other people. And Paul says, when the Spirit's at work, is it, is it work in our life, when we're empowered by the Spirit, when we bump up against one another, over due time, God begins to redeem and restore relationships such that we become holier, more like Christ. We, we learn to be gentle by practicing gentleness. We learn to be kind by practicing kindness. We learn to be patient by practicing patience. And the Spirit empowers us in that. 
Everyone can be a holy saint in their own imagination and isolation. But when you start bumping up against other people, you learn quite quickly how limited your resources in and of your own self are to be a patient, kind, or gentle person. It needs, you need the spirit for that. Only when we are empowered can our threshold of love and tolerance for other people increase. So that brings us to this last point, and I'll be quick with this. How then do we lead this empowered life? If Paul says this is the contrast, the flesh and the spirit, in, in empowerment or enslavement, how do we, on that spectrum, begin walking out what it looks like to be empowered by God's very spirit? Well, if you just do a quick survey of the words that Paul uses here, you would see like in verse 16, but I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What a promise. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Then he goes on to say later on, if you're led by the Spirit, in verse 18, and then down in verse 24, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. In verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. What does it look like to walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, uh, learn to be led in all ways by the Holy Spirit? What does that look like? What does it look like to crucify the flesh and all of its desires and corruptions? That's the question we're asking. Again, I like the way the message translates this. In verse 25, it says, Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold on to it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. Now, I would contend this morning that the contrast Paul set up when he says to be led by the Spirit, to walk, by, to walk in the Spirit, uh, to, to trust in the Spirit, all of those things, he's, he's essentially giving us the language of, of faith and repentance. In other words, being, being a, a, a person who is empowered by God's Holy Spirit is an act of faith, but it means you turn towards God. You turn towards His Word. You turn towards Him and say, these are the ways that the flesh is operating in my heart, my soul, and my life. And by faith, I'm going to trust that Jesus has covered that with His own grace. His blood that has been shed on my behalf has covered that. And so now I can walk in freedom towards love and service. That's an act of faith, but it's also an act of repentance. It means acknowledging the ways that the flesh has corrupted us, acknowledging the ways before God that the flesh has taken a hold of our hearts. The ways that when we read these lists, we say, yeah, that's in me. Impurity, sensuality, that's, that's in there, and it's, it feels like it's deep down, and I don't know if I'm ever going to root it out of my life. God, I need you. It's an act of trust. It's an act of faith. It's, it's an act of repentance, an act of confession. And so it looks like surrender. What does it look like then to, to walk this out? It looks like surrender. Paul does this for us back in chapter 2, by the way. The language that he uses here about life in the Spirit it, it's reflective of something that he wrote back in chapter 2, verse 20. When he talks about crucifying the flesh with its desires, that's language that he's used before. Galatians chap, chapter 2, verse 20, he writes, But I have been crucified with, with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, verse 21, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, if you want to walk the, the life of empowerment, something in you has to die. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ Jesus lives in me. That's what it looks like when Paul tells the church, crucify the flesh and its desires. Go back to the cross. See what Jesus gave up to, to, to reconcile you to God. And then bring all that you are, even your sin and, and your rebellion and your fleshly experiences to the cross and let it die there. And then... This very personal transaction happens between Paul and Jesus. The life I now live, I live by faith. Trusting in that act, that what Jesus did on my behalf is enough to reconcile me to God. I live by faith in the Son of God who, catch this, loved me and gave himself for me. Until the gospel becomes real and becomes personal. Until the gospel becomes the experience of God's great love poured out on us through the person of Jesus in his death and resurrection. Until that happens, the life of empowerment is impossible for us. But when it happens, all things become possible. Because we're now, we're now a living vessel of God's very Holy Spirit, empowered to do great things for his kingdom, to live into this world for his glory, and to even be let loose from the shackles, the enslavement of our own flesh. So God, let that be true for us this morning.
Let it be true that in turning to you in faith and repentance, we would experience once again the liberating act of your spirit freeing us to love and serve others. God, our flesh feels so strong at times. It feels as though every temptation, no matter how big or small it may be, beckons at our door and lures us into, again, a life of enslavement. So God, would you remind us that that the spirit is stronger than our flesh? The Jesus who overcame death on our behalf has also given us resurrection life through the Holy Spirit, and we can walk in an empowered way. And Lord, would that be evidence this morning by your church committing to, to walk these things out in step with the Spirit, to be led by your Spirit, and in so doing, love and serve others to the glory of your great name. That's the name we pray in this morning, the name of Jesus. Amen.